Hey there everybody, it's Max here again with you, Max, and today we've got another special video for you. We're gonna be showing you a full operator's guide on how to use the Einstar 2, Shining 3D's newest budget powerhouse scanner. We're gonna be showing you calibration, setup, scanning, meshing, and export. So let's go ahead and dive in. Let's get to it. The Einstar 2 has exploded onto the scene as Shining 3D continues to push laser scanning into even the most affordable category of the market. The Einstar 2 has received an upgrade to hybrid scanning. The IR is faster, the laser mode has doubled its capable resolution. But with so many features becoming accessible, many new users are experiencing them for the first time. Let's talk about that a little bit more while we crack open the scanner and see what's inside. Everything included in this guide will be timestamped down below, so feel free to skip around to whatever part you need. And uh, let's go ahead and get right into setting up the workspace. You know, they say to save the best for last, but let's take a look at our scanner. This is the Einstar 2. Setup for this unit is pretty straightforward as it's designed with portability in mind. So all you really need to do is make sure your batteries are charged with the included battery charging kit. If you need extra battery life, you could always plug it in with the included USB-C cable to a power bank or a PC. Besides that, you're going to need a capable PC or laptop. It's notable that you need at least these specs here, and if you're running a laptop, assure that you're not running in power saving mode, as that will degrade the scanner's performance. Opening the software for the first time, you'll have to register your product. Doing so is pretty easy. All you have to do is create an account with an email. Then after that, we can dive right into calibration, so let's go ahead and pop a battery in our scanner and connect. I already have a battery in mind, so let's go ahead and review the connection methods. You can connect wirelessly using the built-in hotspot or wired with the included cable. All you need to do to connect wirelessly is hold the middle button down on the scanner for a few seconds. Wait until you see the flashing blue light, then you can connect the scanner on the software. Press the plus button here in the corner and simply select your scanner, it should be listed in the menu. If not, check that the hotspot is available on the network list. Connecting wired is very simple as well. All you need to do is plug in the scanner into the computer and press the connect button. If it doesn't work after that, try replugging it a few times or restarting the scanner. Now on to calibration. Calibration should be done before first operation. And as for me, I also like to calibrate about once a month after a fall or if I'm noticing any performance anomalies. Pretty easy, all you need to do is follow the on-screen instructions, and they're pretty well done, so we won't go into it too much, but generally what you're going to be doing is setting up a calibration board at various angles and then scanning it at various elevations. After we complete that for both modes and then do our light balance calibration, we can move on to selecting our settings for our subject. So switching over to scanning now, let's talk a little bit about our settings. Your settings should be tailored exactly to your scanning subject in order to get the best results and the smoothest scanning experience. So your first choice is going to be IR versus laser mode. IR is going to be your choice for when you need speed and ease of use over accuracy and precision. It's also really good at outdoor subjects and larger subjects in general. It also does really well at capturing color. It's also good for when you don't want to use markers. It can utilize feature tracking as well as color texture tracking. On the other hand, laser mode will be your choice whenever you need accuracy and precision. It has a great resolution and does well with difficult to scan materials, such as reflective or black objects. It can also take advantage of many of the same technologies that the IR mode has by integrating them both in the same scan mode, albeit at greater power draw. This allows you to use the laser mode scanning while utilizing feature tracking, so you don't always need markers. You can also capture color this way too. Regardless of what mode you go with, you're going to have to choose an appropriate resolution for your subject. Maxing out the resolution with larger subjects can lead to bloated file sizes where you might not even be able to process your data anymore. Mileage will vary based on your computer specs, but generally for most consumer rigs, this will be the case. Surface type is also very important. The reflective mode will work great for most objects, like reflective, of course, and black objects. But for any objects that don't necessarily need the higher light, you might end up with more garbage data. So try to only use it when you need to. For the brightness setting, I would recommend using the auto exposure if you're using the IR mode. For the laser mode, you'll have to adjust the brightness manually. Just assure that the laser lines are well defined and bright in the preview camera window as well as in real life. 
Your alignment mode is very important because it determines how your scanner figures out where it is relative to the real world and the digital world. Feature alignment will do this via the actual physical geometry on the object. So it works best for subjects that have rich geometric details, so not smooth car panels. Marker tracking uses these markers to figure out where the scanner is, and it wants to see at least four of them at all time. They can be placed on your subject or around them if it's small enough, so keep that in mind. Lastly, texture tracking uses the color differences on the surface in order to figure out where it is. So objects with intricate paint or designs on it will be perfect for this mode. Sometimes it requires a little bit of experimentation to find the best settings for your subject. Data quality indicator is another good setting to know. All it does is it places a color map on your data while you're scanning so you know how complete it is. You wanna make sure all the important parts of your subject are blue or you might see some incomplete parts in your mesh later. So I know you all have been waiting for this. Let's go ahead and finally get into the scanning. Couple tips while you're scanning. Move the scanner slowly and steadily. Fast or jerky movements make the scanner lose tracking. Keep the scanner within its recommended working distance and watch the working distance indicator as you move. Move your body instead of moving your wrist to keep a smoother motion while scanning. If you're relying on feature tracking, assure that your scanner is always looking at something that's unique and it's familiar with. This is important when going around corners. Helper objects or auxiliary objects you have lying around can be used to break up symmetry and add geometry in places where it's missing for necessary tracking. For markers, make sure that the scanner can see at least four of them at all times. If necessary, you can put more on even mid-scan, just be careful not to scan a marker sheet or change the relative position of the markers to other markers while you're scanning. If you end up changing the position of some markers relative to others, like if you have your subject on a table with markers, you can always delete those in the scanner software. Now that we're satisfied with our scan, let's go ahead and clean up our data a little bit. Shining3D's data editing tools are a pleasure to use as always. Your lasso tools are probably going to be your bread and butter, allowing you to shift and drag to select data. From there, you can use tools like Connected Domain to select all the connected data to your selection, or Invert, and of course, Delete. The cutting plane can be placed by selecting data on a surface like a table. Then we can keep it in place to automatically cull any data that we scan that would be under it. We can also edit markers with this button here, switching from data. But before we mesh, we're going to have to optimize our point clouds first. All that does is gets rid of any junk data and verifies the quality of our scan. Once that's done and our data looks complete, we can go ahead and press the meshing button down here. Now let's review our mesh settings. Watertight will attempt to seal the object's holes completely, whereas semi-watertight does so to a lesser extent, preserving the shape of the object where necessary. The rest of the settings are pretty straightforward. But for more info, check out the tooltips. Now let's press preview and generate our mesh. Looks great. If not though, we can revert with this button here. Mine looks good, so we'll confirm. Now let's move to post-processing. Here we have many of the same options, but with some finer control. Good for fixing cosmetic blemishes or reducing the file size. The software even has a few measuring tools for some quick measurements if you need them on the fly. Point-to-point -point measurements can be taken by shift-clicking different parts on our mesh. You can also measure surface areas by lasso-clicking an entire area. Volumetric measurements can also be taken if your mesh is watertight. After we're happy with our finished mesh, we can either export directly to Xmodel for reverse engineering or directly to file as STL, PLY, OBJ for your mesh, ASC for your point cloud, P3 for your markers, and finally, if you ever want to brush up on this information, you can find the user manual in the software right here. Thank you for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed and learned a lot about the Einstar 2. And if you're looking forward to getting your own Einstar 2, make sure you head to umax.com for amazing deals, free training, and accessories. Thank you for watching. Bye.